You tell, you help people understand why it's necessary and important for them to grow up and adopt responsibility. Why that isn't a shake your finger and get your act together sort of thing. Why it's more like, why it's more like uh, a delineation of the kind of destiny that makes life worth living. I've been telling young men, and, but it's not. I wasn't specifically aiming this message at young men to begin with. It just turned out that way. And it's mostly you admit it's mostly men listening. I mean, it is. Your audience is a male. Well, it's about eighty right? percent on, on YouTube, which is a YouTube is a male domain yeah, primarily. So it's hard to tell how much of it is because YouTube is male, how, how much of it is because of what I'm saying. But um, you, you, what I've been telling young men is that there's an actual reason why they need to grow up, which is that they have something to offer. You know that that. That people have within them this capacity to set the world straight, and that's necessary to manifest in the world, and that also doing so is where you find meaning that sustains you in life. So what's going wrong then? Oh God, all sorts of things have gone wrong. I, I think that I don't think that young men are here words of encouragement. Some some of them never in their entire lives, as far as I can tell. That's what they tell me. And in fact, uh -oh. the words that I've been that I've been speaking, the YouTube lectures that I've done and put online, for example, yes, have had such a sad. dramatic impact. Is an indication that young men are starving for this sort of message. Because like, why in the world would they have to derive it from a lecture on YouTube? You now they're not being taught that they that it's important to develop yourself. Does it, does it bother you that the audience is predominantly? Often you treat people for anxiety, you treat them for depression, 
Um, and you and maybe the next most common category after that would be a surgeon's training. And so I've had many, many women, extraordinarily competent women in my clinical consulting practice, and we put together strategies for their career development that involve continual pushing, competing for higher wages, and often triple their wages within a five-year period. Are you celebrate that? Of course. So of do, course. You, do you agree that you would be happy if that pay gap was eliminated completely? It because that's depend. all the radical feminists are saying. It would depend on how uh, it was eradicated and how the how, how the disappearance of it was measured. You're saying so if it's, it's at the cost of men, that's a problem. Oh, there's all sorts of things that it could be at the cost of. It could even be at the cost of women's own interests. So, because they might not be happy if they get equal pay. No, because it might interfere with other things that are causing the pay gap that women are choosing to like do. Like having well, children. Well, or choosing careers that actually happen to be paid less, which women do a lot of. But why shouldn't women have the right to choose not to have children, or the right to choose they, those demanding careers? They do. They can. Yeah, that's fine. They but you're saying that makes them unhappy, by and large. I'm saying that that, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, I, and I actually haven't said that so far. You're saying it that. makes them miserable. No, I said that what was making why? them miserable was having, part, was having weak partners. That makes them miserable. Right, um, I would say that many women around the age of, I would say between 28 and 32, have a career family crisis that they have to deal with. And I think that's partly because of the foreshortened time frame that women have to contend with. Like, women have to get the major pieces of their life put together faster than men, which is also part of why men aren't under so much pressure to grow up. So because for the typical woman, um, she has to have the career this. family in order pretty much by the time she's 35, because otherwise the options start to run out. And so that puts a tremendous amount of stress on women, especially at the end of their 20s. I mean, I take issue with the idea of the typical woman, because, you know, all women are different. And that's, I want to just put another quote to you from the book. Well, they're different in some ways and the same in others. Okay, you say women become more vulnerable when they have children. Oh. And you talked to one of your YouTube interviews about crazy harpy sisters. So, simple question. Is gender equality a myth in your view? Is that something that's just never going to happen? It depends on what you mean by equality. You know, if you mean fairly, men and women, getting the same opportunities? Fairly. People, we could get to a point where people were treated fairly or more fairly. I mean, people are treated pretty fairly in Western culture already. But we they're really that. not, though, are they? I mean, otherwise, oh, why would there only be seven women running for 100 companies in the UK? Why, why would there still be a pay gap, which we've discussed? Oh, well, that's, that's that's like, that's why are women at the BBC saying that they're getting paid illegally less than men to do the same job? Well, that's not fair. Let's go to the first question. They're both are complicated questions. Seven, seven women, repeat that one. There's seven women running the top 100 companies in the UK. Well, I mean, the first, the first question might be um, why would you want to do that? Why would a man want to do it? There's a certain number of men, although not that many who are perfectly willing to sacrifice virtually all of their life to the pursuit of a high-end career. So they'll work. These are men that are very intelligent. They're usually very, very conscientious. They're very driven. They're very high energy. They're very healthy. And they're willing to work 70 or 80 hours a week, nonstop, specialized, at one thing to get to the top. So you're saying women are just more sensible. They don't want that because it's not a nice life. I'm saying that's part of it, definitely. And so I work so you, for, you don't think there are barriers in their way that prevent them getting to the top? Oh, there are some companies. barriers, yeah. Like, other, like men, for example. I mean, to get to the top of any organization is an incredibly competitive enterprise. And the men that you're competing with are simply not going to roll over and say, please take the position. So it's it's absolutely all-out warfare. Is gender equality a myth? I don't know what you mean by the question. Men and women aren't the same, and they won't be the same. That doesn't mean they can't be treated fairly. Is gender equality desirable? If it means equality of outcome, then almost certainly it's undesirable. That's already been demonstrated in Scandinavia. Because in Scandinavia, what do you mean by that? Equality of outcome is undesirable. Well, men and women won't sort themselves into the same category if you leave them alone to do it off their own court. We've already seen that in Scandinavia. It's 20 to so, 1 female nurses to male, something like that. It might not be quite that extreme. And approximately the same male engineers to female engineers. And that's a consequence of the free choice of men and women in the societies that have gone farther than any other societies to make gender equality the purpose of the law. Those are ineradicable differences. You can eradicate them with tremendous social pressure and tyranny. But if you leave men and women to make their own choices, you will not get equal outcome. Right, so you're saying that anyone who believes in equality, whether you call them feminist, call them whatever you want to call them, should basically give up because it ain't going to happen. Only if they're equality of outcome. So you're saying give people equality of opportunity, that's fine. It's not only fine, it's eminently desirable for everyone, for individuals and for society. But still women aren't going to make it, that's what you're really saying. It depends on your measurement techniques. They're doing just fine in medicine. In fact, there are far more female physicians than there are male physicians. There are lots of, uh, lots of disciplines that are absolutely dominated by women. Many, many disciplines. And they're doing great. So let me put something else to you from the book. You say the introduction of the equal pay for equal work argument immediately complicates even salary comparison beyond practicality mm -hmm. for one simple reason. Who decides what work is equal? It's not possible. So the oh. simple question is, do you believe in equal pay? Well, I made the argument there. So it depends on so you don't believe in equal pay. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that at all. Because a lot of people listening to you will just yes, say, I'm going back to the They're actually not listening. They're I'm just being very careful. I'm anything. hearing you basically saying women need to just accept they're never going to make it on equal terms. Equal outcomes is how you define it. No, I didn't if I was say a young that. woman that watching equal... that, I would go, well, I might as well just go and play with my Cindy dolls. I'm not trying at school because I'm not going to get the top job I want. Because there's someone sitting there saying it's not possible. I said the equal outcomes are desirable. That's what I said. It's a bad social role. I didn't say that women shouldn't be striving for the top or anything like that because I don't believe that for a second. Striving for the top, but you have all those hurdles in their way, as has been in their way for centuries. And that's fine. You're saying that's fine. No, no, I think I really think I really think that's silly. I do. I think that's silly. I really do. I mean, look, look at your situation. You're hardly unsuccessful. Yeah, no, I have. You've been hard to get. Exactly. Where I've got to. Good. So that's okay. Battling is good. This is all about inevitable. Fight. But you talk about men why, fighting. Why would you just put another thing to you? Why would you have to battle for a high quality position? Well, I noticed in your book you talk about real conversations between men containing quote an underlying threat of physicality. Oh, there's no doubt about that. What about real conversations between women? Is that something all obese to amenable and reasonable? No, it's just that the domain of physical conflict is sort of off limits for you. You just said that I to get where I've got. Yeah, but what does that mean? Well, I, don't man, I don't imagine that you, yeah, to some degree, I suspect you're not very agreeable. So that's the thing. Successful women, I'm not very agreeable. Right. But I don't have that actually in this conversation. And I'm sure it served well. your career well. Successful women, though, mm -hmm. basically have to wear the trousers in your view. They have to sort of become men to succeed, is what you're saying. Well, if I have to fight to succeed, they're going to be against men. Certainly, masculine traits are going to be helpful. I mean, one of the things I do in, in my counseling practice, for example, when I'm yeah, consulting with women who are trying to advance their careers, is to teach them how to negotiate with you and to be able to say no and to not be easily pushed around
It's not true. So, for what example, happens? well, I can give you an example very quickly. So, I work with women who worked in high powered law firms in Canada for about 15 years, and they were as competent and put together as anybody you would ever meet. And we were trying to figure out how to further their careers. And there was a huge debate in Canadian society at that point that was basically ran along the same lines as your argument is that if the law firms didn't use these masculine criteria, then perhaps women would do better. But the market sets the damn game. It's like, and the market is dominated by men. No, it's, well, not, it's not. The market is dominated by women. They make 80% of the consumer decisions. That's not the case well, at all. If you're talking 80%. about people who stay at home looking after children, by and large, they are still women. So they're going out doing the shopping. But that is changing. They make all yeah, the consumer decisions. Okay, so the market is driven by women, not men. Right. Okay, and if you're a lawyer, and they still Canada, pay more for the same sort of goods. That's been proven that men, for the, you buy a blue bicycle helmet, it's going to cost less than a pink one. Anyway, we'll come on to that. It's partly because men are less agreeable. <laughs> right, so, so they won't put up with it. I want to ask you. Is it not desirable to have some of those female traits you're talking about? I'd say that's a generalization, but you've used mm -hmm. the words female traits. Is it not desirable to have some of them at the top of business? I mean, maybe there wouldn't they wouldn't have been a banking crisis. They don't predict success in the workplace. The things that predict success in the workplace are intelligence and conscientiousness. Agreeableness negatively predicts success in the workplace. So, you're, so saying, you're saying that women aren't intelligent enough to run these top companies? No, I didn't say that. Uh, you said that uh, female traits don't predict success. But I didn't say that intelligence wasn't. I didn't say that intelligence yeah, and conscientiousness. Well, you were saying that intelligence and conscientiousness are not female traits. No, no. I mean, that's very that. I'm not saying that at all. Are women less intelligent than men? No, no, they're not. No, the, the data on that's pretty clear. The average IQ for a woman and the average IQ for a man is identical. There is some debate about the flatness of the distribution, which is something that James Damore pointed out, for example, in his memo, but there's no difference at all in general cognitive ability. There's no difference to speak of in conscientiousness. Women are a bit more orderly than men, dependent. and men are a little bit more industrious than women. But the difference isn't big. But all that average is into conscientiousness. Any men who aren't necessarily well, of course. Female traits, though, why are they not desirable at the top of it? Feminine traits, why are they not desirable at the top of it? It's hard to say. I'm just laying out the empirical evidence. Like we, know the, we know the traits that predict success. But we also know, because companies by and large have not been dominated by women over the centuries, there's nothing to compare it to. It's an experiment. True, and it could be the case that if companies modified their behavior and became more feminine, they would be successful. But you there's no evidence for it. I'm not neither doubtful nor non-doubtful. There's no evidence. So why not for give it a go? Is that because the evidence suggests, well, it's fine. If, like, if someone wants to start a company and make it more feminine and compassionate, let's say, and caring in its overall orientation towards its workers and towards the marketplace, then that's a perfectly reasonable experiment to run. My point is that there is no evidence that those traits predict success in the workplace. And there's evidence. Well, that's not really the case. Women have been in the workplace for what, at least ever since I've been around. The representation of women in the workplace has been about fifty percent. So we run the experiment for a fairly reasonable period of time, but not, you know, certainly not for centuries. Let me move on to another debate that's been very controversial for you. Um, and this and is, I got in trouble for refusing to call trans men women by their preferred personal pronouns. No, well, that's not actually true. I got in trouble because I said I would not follow the compelled speech dictates of the federal and provincial government. I actually never got in trouble for not calling anyone anything. Right? That, that didn't happen. wouldn't follow the change of law, which was designed not once to outlaw was discrimination. No, no. Why yeah, well, that's your... what they said it was designed to do. Okay, you cited freedom of speech in that. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. Well, I'm, I'm very bad at putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, I'm very bad at putting you on the spot. You did my point. You did my point. It's like you're, you're doing what you should do, which is digging a bit to see what the hell's going on. So that is what you should do. But you're exercising your freedom of speech to certainly risk offending me. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. I think more power to you as far it's as I'm concerned. Mad. So you haven't sat there and. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to work that out. I mean, Ha, gotcha. You have got me. You have okay. got me. I'm trying to work that through in my head. Yeah, yeah. It took a while. It took a while. It took a while. You have voluntary, you have voluntarily one. come into the studio and agreed to be questioned. Mm -hmm. A trans person in your class has come to your class and said they want to be called. And that's she. never happened. And I would call them she. So you would. So you've kind of changed your tune on no, that. No, no, I said that right from the beginning. What I said at the beginning was that I was not going to cede the linguistic territory to radical leftists, regardless of whether or not it was put in law. That's what I said. You and then the people who came after me said, well, you must be transphobic and you mistreat a student in your class. It's like, I never mistreated a student in my class. I'm not transphobic. And that isn't what I said. Wait, so you've also called trans campaigners authoritarian, haven't you? I mean, isn't that. Well, only in the broader context of my claims that radical leftist ideologues are authoritarian. Yes, which they you're are. saying someone who's trying to work out their gender identity, you may well have struggled with that, had quite a no tough time over the years. Yeah. You're comparing them with, you know, Chairman Mao, who no, just the of the deaths of millions of people. Well, just even the if the activists, you know, they're trans people too, they have a right to say these things. Yeah, but they don't have a right to speak for their whole community. To compare them to Chairman Mao, you know, Pinochet, or Kosovo Pinochet. I mean, you know, this is grossly insensitive. Right? No, I didn't compare them to Pinochet. Well, I did compare them to Mao. He was an authoritarian. He's a right winger, though. I was comparing them to the left wing totalitarians. And I do believe they are left wing totalitarians. Under Mao, millions of people died. I mean, there's no comparison to Mao and a trans activist, is there? Why not? Because trans activists aren't killing millions of people. The philosophy that's guiding their utterances Why is the not? same philosophy. The consequences not are... Yet. You're saying that trans activists no. could lead to the deaths of millions of people. What no, I'm saying that the philosophy that drives their utterances is the same philosophy that already has driven us to the deaths of millions of people. Okay, tell us how that philosophy what? is in any way comparable. Sure, that's no problem. The first thing is, is that the philosophy presumes that group identity is paramount. That's the fundamental philosophy that drove the Soviet Union and Maoist China. And it's the fundamental philosophy of the left-wing activists. It's identity politics. It doesn't matter who you are as an individual. It matters who you are in terms of your group identity. You're just That's saying murderous. things like to provoke, aren't you? I mean, you are a provocateur. You're like anything. the alt-right that you hate to be compared to. You um, want to stir things up. I'm only a provocateur insofar as when I say what I believe to be true, it's provocative. I don't provoke. Maybe for humor. Now provoke. and then. I'm not interested in provoking. But what about things about, you know, fighting and the lobster? Tell us about the lobster. Well, that's quite a segue. Well, the first chapter I have in my book yes, is called people. Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back. And it's an injunction to be combative. Um, not least to further your career, let's say but also to adopt 
Yes, I want to stance of ready engagement with the world and to reflect that in your posture. Yes, and the reason that I yes, read about law is because there's this idea that hierarchical structures are a sociological construct of the Western patriarchy. Yes, and that is so untrue idea. that it's almost unbelievable. Only. And I use the lobster as an example because the lobster, we, we divulged from lobsters in evolutionary history about 350 million years ago, common ancestor. And lobsters exist in hierarchies and they have a nervous system attuned to the hierarchy. And that nervous system runs on serotonin, just like our nervous systems do. And the nervous system of the lobster and of the human being is so similar that antidepressants work on lobsters. And it's part of my attempt to demonstrate that the idea of hierarchy has absolutely nothing to do with sociocultural construction, which it doesn't. <laughs> You're saying that we should organize our societies along the lines of lobsters. I'm saying that it's inevitable that there will be continuity in the way that animals okay. and human beings organize, organize their structures. It's, it's it absolutely inevitable. And there is one third of a billion years of evolutionary history behind that. Right? That's, that's so long that a third of a billion years ago, there weren't even trees. It's a long time. You have a mechanism in your brain that runs on serotonin that's similar to the lobster mechanism that tracks your status. And the higher your status, the better your emotions are regulated. So as your serotonin levels increase, you feel more positive emotion and less negative emotion. So you're saying, like the lobsters, we're hardwired as men and women to do certain things, to sort of run along tram lines, and there's nothing we can do about it. No, I'm not saying there's nothing we can do about it, because it's like a, in a chess yeah, game, right? There's lots of things that you can it. do, although you can't break the rules of the chess game and continue to play chess. Biological, your, your biological nature is somewhat like that, is it sets the rules of the game, but within those rules, you have a lot of leeway. But the idea that, but one thing we can't do is say that hierarchical organization is a consequence of the capitalist patriarchy. It's like, that's patently absurd. It's wrong. It's not a matter of opinion. It's seriously wrong. Aren't you just whipping people up into a state of anger and Not at all. Your divisions between men and women? You're stirring people up. You know, you have any critics of you online get absolutely lambasted by your followers. You and by me, generally. Me. Sorry, your critics get lambasted by you. I mean, if is not at all. If an academic is going to come okay. after me and tell me that I'm not qualified and that I'm not, I don't know what I'm talking about. So you're not going to say to your followers now, quit the abuse, quit the anger. Well, we need some substantial examples of the abuse okay. of anger before what? I can detail that question. There's a lot of it out so, there. So, well, let, let's take a more general perspective on that. So I've had 25,000 letters since June, something like that, from people who told me that I brought them back from the brink of destruction. And so I'm perfectly willing to put that up against the rather vague accusations that my followers are making the lives of people that I've targeted miserable. Do you want to them? Thank you. My pleasure. Nice talking okay, with you. Nice. I don't think anyone has been sued for not calling the panel, though. I think there was a very quick message. I guess I'm going to put that down since Peter.